This is Solve It for Kids. Hello, my amazing and curious friends. My name is Jennifer, and this is Solve It for Kids, the podcast that gives kids and families a peek inside the real world of scientists, engineers, and experts as they solve problems in their jobs using creativity, cooperation, and critical thinking. And now, please welcome to the show my podcast partner, Galactic Space Geek, Jeff Ganya. Hey, Jennifer. This is another one of those episodes where I don't have time to talk to you right now. We have got to get to this guest because I am Galactic Space Geek, and he has a super cool job. Okay, well then what problem is he solving? How do scientists listen to black holes? Oh, now I understand. How do scientists listen to black holes? This is going to be fabulous. Who is our guest, Jeff? That is right. How you listen to black holes. You heard that right, everybody. And today we are going to be talking with Dr. Eric Thrain astrophysicist, university professor, and gravitational wave scientist who is going to tell us about one of the most amazing discoveries that has happened in the last hundred years in science. Welcome to the show, Dr. Eric. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Oh, uh, so I think this is one of our coolest episodes and we haven't even started. So you work with gravitational waves. So the big question is, what are gravitational waves? <laughs> Indeed. So it all begins with Einstein's theory of gravity, which is called general relativity. And according to Einstein, space and time are combined into something called space time. And you can visualize it like a rubber sheet. That rubber sheet, rubber sheet okay. has things like planets and stars on it. And when you put them on the rubber sheet, the sheet warps, it sags. And that warping is the presence of gravity. That's what the force of gravity is. It is essentially the warping of space time. So for example, if you want to think about the motion of the moon around the earth, imagine putting a bowling ball on a rubber sheet. The bowling ball is the earth. It causes the sheet to sag. And then you take a little marble that represents the moon and you roll it on this sagging rubber sheet and it will go in a little circle around the bowling ball representing the earth. That's the picture that Einstein gave us of how gravity works and the rubber sheet. That's the warped space time and gravity, according to Einstein, is just the motion of these marbles and balls, planets and stars on a warped sheet of space-time. So far, so good? That's the so coolest, far, so ex- I know, right? That's the coolest explanation. Ever. Now I understand. That's so cool. All right, but we got to work up to- The rubber sheet made it much more understandable. Yes. Cool. So this is the picture we've had of how gravity works for about a hundred years. And once you have this picture of general relativity in your mind, there are some pretty weird consequences. One consequence is that you can get holes in your fabric sheet. You can get punctures. So if someone comes by and they put a really, really big bowling ball on your stretchy sheet and they pile mass onto it and make it bigger and bigger, what will happen? The sheet will sag more and more, right? Yes. Right. Eventually, if that sheet sags too much, it will get a hole in it, a puncture a rip in the fabric of space-time. And that rip, that puncture, is called a black hole. This is a region of space-time that is so stretched, so distorted, that no light can escape from it. And we think of it as a a hole in the fabric of space-time. That doesn't sound good. I mean, right? I mean, I mean, I'm just thinking, okay, real like we've watched all of these these TV shows and movies, and you know that space time ripping is bad, right? So it sounds it sounds bad, but we're very safe here on Earth. The black okay. holes 
like to stay where they are and mind their own business. So they're fascinating objects, a little bit scary when you first learn about them, but like many things in science, as Mary Curie said, just they're not to be feared, only to be understood. Okay. So we now we have, we've done two concepts. We're working our way up to gravitational waves, which was the, you know, whether our, or this is our selling point, right? Yes. Is we did the fabric sheet of space-time, and now we have these black holes, these rips in the fabric of space-time. And now finally we have what we need to make gravitational waves. If you have two black holes, two rips in the fabric of space-time, and you take them and you smash them together, this is a little bit like taking two bowling balls on your fabric sheet and smashing them together, what will happen? The answer is it's a little bit like taking a pebble and throwing it into the center of a pond. Uh Little waves or ripples emanate outward from the splash and you'll see them spreading in a circular pattern outward as they get to the edge of the lake. The same thing happens when two black holes smash into each other. They make waves, but these waves aren't water waves. They're ripples in the very fabric of space-time itself. And these waves travel to us all the way at Earth, maybe 1.3 billion years later in some cases. And they cause tiny, almost unimaginably small stretching in the fabric of our space-time here on Earth. And I have a challenge now for our listeners, if I may. Oh, please. So if you're sitting please stand up and I'm going to have a gravitational wave come through you. Are you ready? Everyone's standing. Okay. We're standing. All right. So everyone's standing up. I want you to stretch up as high as you can and suck in your tummies and put your head up as high as you can. And then slink back down, bulge yourself out at the middle and put your arms out wide. That's what it's like to be stretched by a gravitational wave passing right through your tummy It makes you first taller and a little bit skinnier, and then it stretches you the other way and it makes you slightly wider and shorter. And it oscillates back and forth, short and thin, tall and wider, short and thinner, taller and wider. And it does this, we think all the time, these gravitational waves are passing through us, stretching us just very, very slightly, but they're so small, you can't tell that they're passing through you, you can't feel it. So what we need to do is make special instruments in order to detect these very small ripples in the fabric of space-time. Okay, so I'm following so far, I understand. Yes. So we obviously now have that special equipment, which is, I'm guessing, which is part of why it's been 100 years since Einstein first described this effect, but we haven't seen it until now. The story of how gravitational waves were detected is an amazing story about human perseverance and the ability of people to take on some of the most challenging scientific problems and engineering problems that the universe can throw at us. So as you said, Einstein pointed out about 100 years ago, this idea of gravitational waves. And for a long time, people debated whether they were purely mathematical, something that is not a real effect that you can feel, but to just something with numbers. Later, scientists agreed that they must be real and set about to building detectors that could measure them. But it took thousands of scientists working over many decades and hundreds of millions of dollars of investment from governments to build technology that would allow this to happen. In particular, the invention and perfection of lasers, Mm -hmm. devices that could make very pure beams of light, was an essential ingredient in order to detect gravitational waves. Can I tell you how how we did it? Yes, absolutely. So the first observatory to measure gravitational waves is called LIGO. Mm -hmm. And LIGO stands for Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. And it works like this. Can we, shall we do another audience participation for this one? Yes, I think this is great. We're definitely up for it. Put your left hand up in the air, stick it straight up and put your right hand out to the side so that you make an L with your arms, okay? Mm -hmm. These two arms represent 
the four kilometer long arms of the LIGO detector. That is for our American audience, a few miles, uh, <laughs> right? I can't, I can't do this. In, yeah. Okay. Uh, so, and what you're going to do is you have, so when you're in your tummy, that's where the laser is. And it okay. sends a light beam down these two arms. Okay. And the, the laser light beam bounces off a mirror at the end of your two arms. So the mirror is on, it's on your fingertips on each okay. arm and the light bounces off that mirror and it comes back to your heart where the laser was. And when the two light beams come back, we time, how long did it take? You can put your arms now, down now, by the way, <laughs> listeners, we time, how long did it take to go down each arm? Now, if a gravitational wave is stretching you, it's pulling your one arm up and squishing that your the arm you're raising up is getting longer and the arm that you're holding out to the side is getting shorter. But then the next moment, the arm you're holding up is getting shorter and the arm that you're holding out to the side is getting longer. Uh -huh. And by timing how long the light takes to go down each of these two arms, we were able to work out that a gravitational wave had passed through our detector. And what's really neat is that we can say more than just that a gravitational wave passed through, through the detector, we can say something about what created it. And that's because the black holes and neutron stars that create gravitational waves create different gravitational waves depending on how heavy the black holes are. How did you know that though? Like how did you know the difference between two black holes colliding and two neutron stars? Black holes are more massive or heavier than okay. neutron stars. So the black holes that we saw in our very first detection of gravitational waves were real giants. Each one weighed about 30 times more than the mass of our own sun. Imagine oh, wow. all of that crammed into a tiny sphere about the size of a city. That's how amazing black wow. holes are. They're extremely compact. Oh my gosh. A neutron star, but in contrast, is about the same mass of the sun. It's a little bit more massive, but not by that much, about okay. one and a half times the mass of the sun. Okay. So if you have these two black holes and they smash into each other, the, they produce a shorter gravitational wave signal and a lower pitched. So, and here we have to talk a little bit about pitch. Okay. So it turns out that the stretching fabric of space time that we measure with, with our detector called LIGO it's a lot like the data we have is a lot like an audio file because we're measuring the stretching of space time as time changes. So we're making a, a recording in time of the stretching of space time. And that's a lot like when you listen to music, you are hearing a recording of a microphone diaphragm being pressed as a function of time. And so you can take that space-time recording and actually play it back as an audio file. And you can, you can listen to the ripples in space-time of two black holes going into each other. And if the two black holes are more massive, it makes a, a low sound like this. <laughs> and it's very, it's very short. But if the, the two uh, black holes, or if they're neutron stars, are less massive, then it makes a high sound like this. <laughs> and the this, the length of the signal gets longer. And this has to do with the how gravitational waves cause the black holes to spiral into each other. The really massive ones, they are spiraling. We're catching them just at the very end. And so it has this lumbering low sound and we just catch the last little bit, whereas the, okay. the light ones are flickering around and we can hear them at a higher sound for a while. That is fascinating. This I don't is, even know what to say I, other than it, this yeah. is the, we need to, this is the coolest job. I mean, I just keep saying that, this but is wow. Fascinating. And I have two immediate thoughts. Number one on your second activity of one arm up and one arm to the right to make a right angle. As soon as you told me to put my other arm up and you started describing how a gravitational wave would stretch one arm in one direction, but the other arm, the opposite direction, and then they would wiggle back and forth. That sounds so obvious after you explain it to me. <laughs> but before you said that, I was like, how do you even come up with an idea to create a machine yeah. to measure such tiny variances? 
Indeed. Uh, but it and sounds so simple. It is. It is. It's, it's a it's a beautifully simple idea. But even then, controlling all the sources of noise that make it that affect your ability to measure those two directions made it incredibly complicated. But you're you're right. At the core is a very simple idea. Yes, measuring right. how long it takes the light to go down these two arms. But then perfecting it was a endeavor that took. You know, I have I turned forty this year, and I have colleagues who uh, have recently retired in their seventies uh, and who wow. devoted their lives lives oh, to wow. this, their working lives to this discovery, and wow. only got to see it in the twilight of their careers, which is a wonderful a wonderful thing to be yes. part of. Sure. So, how many different lasers does it take to coordinate all of this to get these sounds? Because I'm assuming you're not just pointing one laser, right? Actually, it is just one it laser. One? It's very important wow. that it be one laser because that one laser needs to have a very pure beam of light. And then what we do is we have uh, something called a beam splitter, which is a piece of, uh, think of it as a piece of glass okay. uh, with a shiny coating on it. And it sends half of that light up and uh, half of that light to the side. Okay. And that main, by, by doing it that way, that means that the two beams of light are perfect copies of each other. If they were slightly different, you wouldn't be able to do this trick because we have to control everything and make that, that beam of light very, it has to be identical uh, down the two paths. Now that makes sense. Yes, absolutely. And, and I'm guessing there's a whole lot of math behind all of this. Math is definitely the language of physics, uh, the, the field of science that tells us about gravity and general relativity and black holes and also engineering. Mm -hmm. But this, I'll say, uh, lest people feel intimidated that this is the kind of thing that you can, you can sink your teeth into as a, as a career. It's, it's not the being a part of a science experiment like LIGO is not something reserved for only a small number of people. Th thousands of people were involved with LIGO through wow. its creation. And there were uh, people right. who were building special mirrors and people who job was to coat the mirrors with a special coating people who uh, hang the mirrors from with special wires to make oh, wow. them this uh swing uh, as as purely as possible people who analyze the data people who uh, model black holes so there are many different ways to come at it and all different skills were in, were required wow okay so i've been following along so hopefully our listeners have as well on what gravitational waves are or at least the very start of it what does the detection of real gravitational waves in the physical universe, not just the mathematical universe, like you were saying, what does that mean for uh, our understanding of the universe? Or are we going to get better peanut butter and jelly sandwiches out of it? <laughs> what does that mean? The reason that gravitational waves are so cool is not just that they confirmed a century old prediction of which is mind blowing that Einstein awesome. which is good <laughs> we'll we'll take that yeah. but what's really exciting about them is that they have opened a new window on the universe we are now using gravitational waves to see things that we couldn't see before i mentioned black holes earlier don't allow any light to escape from them so they're, they're very sure. difficult to, to see with a regular telescope. You can't see the black hole directly. Sometimes you can see hot gas falling inside of it. But right. with gravitational waves, the black holes themselves are making these ripples in the fabric of space-time. We can see them very far away. And as our detectors become more sensitive and we can see further and further out, we're going to be able to study the universe back to when the first black holes were uh, created. And this is the birth of a new field of astronomy that we're witnessing. Yes. We are wow. being able to study this previously dark universe that we hadn't seen before and learn, learn about the universe with a totally new way of experiencing it. That's... How cool is that? I know, we just keep saying that, right? <laughs> I, yeah, but like the way you were just describing that and how it opens up a whole new uh, field of astronomy like you are just beginning. All I can think of is Galileo being the first one to point a telescope up in the sky. And 410 years later, we're still doing that with better and better telescopes. Yeah. 
you guys are just starting that. And as a space teacher at a space museum in Colorado, I'm imagining I'm going to start explaining like maps of the night sky that show different rates of gravitational waves coming from different areas. And we're going to be explaining the night sky and gravitational waves as well. Absolutely. This is something that is uh, going to be with us for centuries. And, you know, we're, wow. as you say, we're only at the moment, as I'm talking to you, our collaboration has announced, uh, I believe, about 45 gravitational wave detections. But this is just what? the tip of the iceberg. We think every wow. 200 seconds or so, every couple of minutes, somewhere in the universe, two black holes smash into each other. And as we see more and more of these, we are going to transition from this era where we've seen a few dozen to every few minutes, another one, and we will map the gravitational wave sky. Oh and God. we are just, wow. just starting out on this journey. That. It's a human journey that will span multiple generations as we embark on this new phase of discovery. So you're saying these kids or, you know, young people that are listening to the show could be the ones years from now that are, that find other things or create these maps that Jeff is talking about, right? There will be so many opportunities in the future for the people listening to the show now who are young to be leaders in this field. I mentioned earlier that when we discovered gravitational waves for the first time that I was a relatively junior uh, researcher, or I'll say mid-career, um, but some of my, my colleagues were just approaching retirement and they got to be part of that first discovery, but now they're passing the torch to us to move the, the field forward. When I retire in 25, 30 years, we will have only scratched the surface of this field. We will, there will be new gravitational wave detectors being built. We'll, I hope that by then we'll have a gravitational wave detectors in space. And there will be so much science to do here. And then we'll be passing the torch to the next generation. And I hope that some of our listeners are, are inspired to take up that torch and take us to the next big discovery in black holes and uh, gravity. Yes. I, I don't know how they couldn't be. This is just too cool to want to go learn more about, especially with an entire night sky, apparently full of gravitational waves out there that we haven't seen yet. So I have a question. So take us through like your day, because to me, this is all kind of mind blowing. Are you listening to the black holes? Are you seeing the waves? How does how does this look like? We do listen to them when we do outreach events. But when we're analyzing them, we have to use computers because computers are more sophisticated. They can do fancier things than what I can do by listening to the sounds of, of gravitational waves. And so my day-to-day -day job is a little bit like working at Google or Facebook, I think. I spend a lot of time at a computer. I write computer programs and I meet with other scientists to come up with ideas and we convert our ideas into computer programs that then analyze gravitational wave data. They look through these, basically what you can think of as audio recordings of space time getting stretched. And we try to work out what kind of black hole made that sound. And given that we, let's say we decide it was a 20 solar mass black hole, 20 times the mass of our sun. What can we learn about the universe, about space and time, based on the fact that it was 20 solar masses or, you know, whatever we, we measured. So a lot of that work is in person. It's talking to people. It's coming up with ideas. It's being creative. And then when we go to test our hypotheses, we usually use computers to work out if the hypothesis is true or not. That is fantastic. As a space geek, it sounds like a lot of fun for me. I may not have done quite enough math, but that sounds super cool. Now, you just said that you listen to them mm -hmm. when you do outreach. Is that something we might be able to share on an yeah. audio podcast? Let's do it as a challenge. Okay, that sounds good to me. So I am going to pull up some sounds of black holes. And let's see. I'm going to start by playing you the sound of a single black hole merger. So we have, we're going to listen to two black holes and they are going to be going around each other and then smash together. And what you're going to listen for is something called a chirp. This is a chirp is a sound that starts 
low pitch and then gets higher. So it's going to go whoop, like that. Okay. That was just me though. That wasn't the real one. <laughs> and here we go. This is the sound of, I'll play it again. Oh, you hear that? Yes, I heard that. I heard so, it. Yep. All right. So now we have two challenges. Our first challenge is you are going to try to detect a gravitational wave signal in a gravitational wave detector in noise. So that whoomp, that chirp we heard a moment ago, mm -hmm. I'm going to bury it inside detector noise and you have to hear it. We're going to hear several different chirping sounds and it's the chirp is going to get louder and louder. And if you're playing with, with uh, family or friends, you can call out when you think you hear it. It's going to get louder and louder and we'll see who can hear the most quiet chirp. If you're wearing headphones, maybe unplug your headphones so because there will be a loud sound that I was about to play. Are you ready? We Here are we ready. How many did you count? Four. Four. Yeah, I think that's right. Yay! So uh, they got louder and louder, but that's our job. That's part of our job is to find these chirp sounds in that noisy data. And one of the things that I love about this is it's such a funny sound. It sounds like a slide whistle or something like that. Yes. Yep. But it's a, think about it. That sound, that funny sound is associated with this cataclysmic collision of these two black holes moving at about 60% the speed of light when they hit. And a oh tremendous gosh. amount of energy wow. is released in the collision. And it, yet it, when you convert it into an audio, it makes such a funny uh, sound. Yes, a tiny little. Well, and exactly. how far away are these again? So if you can just barely hear it and that noise, they can be as far away as about a, a billion light years. Oh my God. It depends. It depends on how massive they are. The the he more massive ones, the heavier ones, we can see further away, and the less massive ones, we can't see quite that far. I have one more challenge. Okay. Oh, super. And this challenge is to tell which black hole merger sound is lighter and which one's heavier. Now, the heavier ones have a low pitch, and the lighter ones have a high pitch. So I'm gonna play you two different sounds and we'll see which one you think is heavier. Are you ready? Yes. Yes. That was the first one. Should I play it again? Yes, try that one again. Okay. Okay. And now we'll hear a different one. Should I hear play it again? Sure. All right, any guesses? Which one do you think was the low frequency, short, heavy black hole? And which one was the lighter, less massive pair of black holes? The lower one was the first one, I think. I agree. Yeah, well done. So that one was this two, 30 times the mass of our sun black holes. And the Whoa. second sound I played was more like a, about the mass of the, the sun, a little bit more massive. That is fascinating that they even make different sounds. Yeah. That is, wow. And so when you hear it through the white noise, then are you able to clear out the white noise then and, and then get these, these clear sounds that we're hearing? That's what you're doing? We can never remove noise from any measurement, okay. but what we can do is try to understand the noise and, and the signal as best we can in the presence of noise. Noise is just a fact of life for experimental physics, but it's something that uh, we all have to learn to embrace because no measurement is ever free from it. And this is gets us into a whole other branch of physics about uh, quantum mechanics and however everything <laughs> in the universe has is noisy, but we'll save that maybe for a future podcast. Yes, yes. I mean, that sounds great. All right. So that was the challenge. So we want to hear from you guys. If you guys listened to the challenge and you got everything right. I think this has been a fabulous talk. 
Dr. Eric. I learned so much about black holes. So thank you so much for coming on Salt for Kids. Absolutely. I have to double that. I am definitely going to be, you just gave me a whole bunch of homework, more than you shared with us today. Just like you said, this is the start of a whole new thing. And uh, this is fascinating. Thank you very much for sharing. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Jennifer, can you believe this? This is something we have never been able to say before, but Dr. Eric just gave us a challenge from more than a billion light years away. I mean, my mind is blown. I did not know you could hear black holes or gravitational waves that travel that far. I mean, it's amazing. And Dr. Eric and all the scientists working in that gravitational wave field can tell the difference of what exploded or collided billions of light years away just based on what it sounds like. I mean, it's amazing. So all of you, I hope you guys all did the challenge during the podcast. But if you didn't, or if you want to go back and tell some of your other friends, make sure you go to our website, which is solveitforkids.com. We'll have all of the sounds that Dr. Eric played on our website, on his page. You can learn more about him, more about LIGO if you want. And we'll have a book list and a book giveaway if you participate and maybe send us like an email or tag us in our social media about how you did on the challenge. Now, where do they find us on social media, Jeff? On social media, they're going to find us on Instagram at Kids Solve and on Facebook at Solve It For Kids. And also Twitter at Kids Solve. So we hope that you all do this challenge over and over and over. And so you can listen to these sounds. But until then, next week, we will see you on Solve Solve It It For for kids. Kids.